Oh, and we're live. Mm. Uh, just in time. Good management. Hi. <laughs> Hi. It's good to meet everyone. Where, where is it? I'm in California, so which you can see the sunshine behind me. Uh, <laughs> where's everyone else? I am as well. I'm in the Bay Area. Oh, nice. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> I'm in Germany. Okay. And so usually, usually in Switzerland, but now in the Bahamas. Oh, wow. Living the dream. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like. Uh, I would have expected a much better background than what you have given you in Bahamas. <laughs> you <laughs> don't the ocean. <laughs> we don't believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's uh, start. Um, good afternoon or good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for tuning in in our session, uh, talk, Taking a Startup Beyond Post-COVID. My name is Annette Nijs. I'm a former cabinet minister for education, science and culture in my home country, the Netherlands. But I am in Germany. One of my current positions is uh, being president of a business school in Netherlands, and many of our students are innovative entrepreneurs also in startups. So I'm very curious uh, what you're going to uh, tell us. I think we're going to hear from some excellent panelists, uh, and we're going to discuss what is needed for startups to be as innovative after the pandem and pandemic than before. And post-COVID, a lot of people think think will bring for sure some new normals. Sustainability is higher on the agenda than before. There may be more regional focus complementing the global reach, but organizations may need to be capable to digitalize their operations. I think for many reasons, for working from home, to innovate, maybe using virtual hackathons, to be smart in online engagement with customers and also the other parties and a lively digital ecosystem? And how will they build trust on a distance, for example, with their investors? In other words, what's going to change for startups and how can they keep innovating in the post-COVID world? Let's hear it from our first panelist. And I will brief, briefly introduce you before you share your views, but feel free to tell us some more about yourself if you feel like it. Klaas, may I give you the floor first? Um, Klaas, Klaas de Boer, is a managing partner of an entrepreneur's fund, and uh, you're based in the UK, yeah, Klaas? Over yes, to thanks you. A lot, man. Thank you, Annette. Um, Yes, I'm, I manage a portfolio of, um, of ventures uh, through Entrepreneurs Fund and also a few privately uh, spread across the globe um, and quite often working with uh, physical product and, uh, and, and backed by, by intellectual property. And one of the things with physical product is uh, you can't fully go digital. Um, so maybe let me start by, by describing a few things that happened uh, sort of in the portfolio during the pandemic. And then from there, we can sort of look uh, to, to what it means for the future. Um, in, in some ways, what happened in, in the spring of last year had, had parallels to uh, the global financial crisis in 2008, in the sense that everything ground to a halt very, very quickly. The difference was this time there was a sort of a, a human safety dimension to it, and I think that uh, took uh, center stage in, in the beginning. And what actually uh, I noticed was that businesses, uh, my portfolio companies, were ahead of government in taking measures. So we didn't wait for government to introduce measures, but actually all our businesses started to implement measures ahead of government, uh, led by boards under, under health and safety concerns and, and, and worrying about uh, what's going on. Um, but then the parallel with 2008 is that uh, the investors uh, step on the brakes. They stop looking at anything new and they first look at what they have and how to shore up things. So it's about resilience uh, for the uncertain future that lies ahead. In a number of cases, we uh, we actually realized we were going to, uh, to need to raise funding within uh, nine to 12 months from the, the start of the pandemic. 
So actually that then took priority to make sure that the businesses were, were funded in a way that they could survive uh, an extended period. Uh, many of my businesses are, are pre-revenue developing technologies. Um, and then it becomes uh, the art of the possible is, is the term I've used. Um, in, uh, in a number of cases, we had people working in labs and uh, that work could not sort of be transposed to home. And so we reopened, uh, in most cases, the, the lab functions uh, within a month uh, under uh, all sorts of safe working guidelines. But we had to put people back into their, their physical environments to, uh, to keep these companies uh, going. And uh, that led to, to sort of a hybridization where the, the lab people work on site and all the administrative people work from home. Um, and I think that that creates some some splits in, in organization. So we think about what, where we're now sort of in, in, in Europe and uh, perhaps North America slightly ahead is at the turning point where we're all discussing uh, going back to uh, to the office. Here in the UK, I, um, I met with uh, one of the banks we're working with and they... Uh, said that their new working scheme was going to operate uh, with the acronym TWAT, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. <laughs> um, but also, when it's a sunny day, people are, have gotten used to work from home, and, uh, and people uh, uh, call it a work from home day and stay at home. And you see that, I think, the transition to figuring out what the new working model is going to be is, is, will still take time to, uh, to work out. I, I feel that we have, in, in many organizations, depleted, I, I call it, we've depleted social equity. We, we had existing relationships that were built over time. We used to, uh, to work with each other, and we've sort of depleted that, and we need to rebuild that. So I actually think there will be, in, in, in many of the, the businesses I'm involved in, a bounce back in, in travel. We need to go out, uh, need to meet customers, need to meet partners, need to be, meet investors. But I think we'll also be more sensible about it. Um, I used to fly to Vancouver from London uh, four times a year for a two-day meeting. Um, I think that is going to stop. I will still travel to the West Coast, but then I'll make it longer meetings and try to combine more things rather than flying back and forth uh, for individual meetings all the time. Um, and I think we need to rediscover serendipity. Uh, a lot of innovation uh, happens through human interactions, uh, whether it's over a coffee machine uh, or water cooler or whether it's over lunch or dinner. And I feel that over Zoom, we've become incredibly transactional. We organize meetings, we discuss what we have to discuss, and we rush off to the next one. And even the event today, in a way, uh, reflects that, where people dip in for the part that they're speaking at and then disappearing again, and, and that serendipity that would happen if this were a physical event, I think is, is very hard to replicate in the digital world. We try to use these tools as best as we can, but uh, I, I think we need to go back to that as well. And Klaas, what do you think? Uh, you discussed uh, resilience and the importance of uh, resilience. Um, many people say that may be a new normal um, post-COVID-19, that profit goes a little bit to the background and resilience comes and stays to the forefront. What, what do you think from where you are standing? Um, well, I, it's an easy I, question, but yeah, maybe no, I, to answer. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think. The, it, I'm not sure whether that is a full trade-off, uh, as you describe it. Um, I think there are many different ways in which you build resilience, and, and one of those is to, in, in, in sort of pre-revenue ventures, is to raise more money earlier to uh, to have more time to uh, to deal with an uncertain world. So maybe that's the behavior that's going to change. Um, I, I feel more that things have continued to progress, but not at the pace they used to progress at. And, and I, 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 the challenge will be to, to bring that speed back. We have one business, in, the one in Vancouver that I mentioned earlier, where in the last uh, year and a bit, we've more than doubled the, the headcount in the company. Half the management team is based in, in the United States. The company is in Canada. Um, 
half the uh, staff in the organization have been with the company for less than a year. Many have never met in person. And we need there we probably do need to invest time that you normally would not do in, in, in sort of building, maintaining a, a culture, a set of values, a purpose that is, again, harder to do uh, remotely than it is, uh, is in person. So maybe there we have to sacrifice productivity for a while, uh, but I, I'm sure that will pay back. Thank you. Um, let's go to um, Isabel, Isabel Musli. Uh, you're the chairperson of uh, responsible uh, leadership in Switzerland, or uh, be it that you're now in the Bahamas. Um, what is it that you want to share with us? How will startups have to change or refocus for a while? Uh, you're on mute. We cannot hear you. Yeah, that's that's so thank you, Annette, and hello, everyone. So crises are adrenaline for innovation, so stemming from startups or from within organizations. But still, um, looking at companies' innovation strategy, I'm repeatedly surprised to see that innovation efforts are related to the cash flow. And guess what um, gets cut first uh, in a crisis? So innovations must be a strategic project or initiatives located at the border, at least the CEO level, and financed independently of the daily business. So it's critical that companies have a, an ongoing pool of innovation initiatives in place, not only to create um, a sustainable business, but also to get ahead of the curve during a crisis and or shortly after. So um, while I agree that an entrepreneurial environment is critical for innovation to continue, but also for startups to flourish, and here we're talking about infrastructure, legal framework, um, tax benefits, culture that allows failure, I would like to shed light on a supposedly different topic. Um, it's the inner workings of startups. And I'm a leadership coach. So I work a lot with startups and help them tap the potential and, and um, boost and navigate change. So um, you mentioned single-mindedness and it helps drive startups to success even through a pandemic, but too much single-mindedness um, for too long is, is hindering or can be hindering. So it's not enough. Why do startups fail despite solid funding and marketability? It's because of team issues. It's easy to talk about the rationally anchored keywords such as strategy and business development, risk management, etc. cetera. Um, but um, by the way, at startups um, are quite strongly supported in these areas. Um, but who implements all these? You know, why do they succeed or fail? It's because of what I call um, the last mile. So in general, it's the people. Last mile, it's the people. Um, and generally, but especially during a crisis, the pressure founders and the team members experience is immense, stemming from the market, from um, investors, from from family, from teammates, from the self, from the board, etc. How to deal with high pressure, um, with limited resources, especially in a crisis, how to navigate change, to remain agile and, and creative and still have a structure that allows for growth how to select and develop the right team and when and, and where to acquire the leadership skills that are needed um, to provide direction and to inspire others. So the human element gets underestimated often because it's not hard science. And then I hear often, yes, it's a risk, but it's, it's a black box. No. So it's here that we need and can actually help them um, regardless of whether we are a corporate, an incubator, accelerator, a board member or an investor. And back briefly to single-mindedness, it boosts focus, dedication, uh, commitment and decision-making, but it's a marathon and marathon cannot be completed with sprint pace. So it's not uncommon for entrepreneurs or even expected of them to work 12, 16 hours a day without charging and without taking even 10 minutes to look at the bigger picture. So we need to help them occasionally um, step back and look at the bigger picture and do a reality check, ideally by people who tell the truth, like the jester um, in, in the old days um, that provided the news to the king, just to ensure the alignment of, of strategy and structure and people and culture. So in, in short, 
we must invest in and support both the backbone and the heartbeat and the leadership thereof. And um, Isabel, um, uh, in terms of the inner workings uh, mm -hmm. of, of a startup, um, how do you think this can be positively influenced? So it's, uh, I mentioned the backbone, so that's vision, mission, strategy, but also structure for growth. So have clarity of roles and responsibilities and don't build organizations around people. The heartbeat here, it's about um, selecting and developing the right teams, uh, have a culture of trust, and you mentioned trust and you class, it's the glue to any relations. Um, manage expectations, communicate and not by reading signs. Blows my mind to see how often it's reading by signs and bring uncomfortable things to the table early. But leadership starts with self-leadership. So those founders that um, succeed in the long terms are almost always the ones that learn about themselves the fastest. Leading is not the same as being the leader. There's this famous founder syndrome that often ends in a tragedy and, and this needn't be the case. So it's also wise, and you, Claus, alluded to it, um, to look for startups that, that didn't make it, so failed um, because of the experience and the, no the knowledge. And we need to help them also grow through it because they're building resilience through this and such experience is just invaluable in a, in a crisis. So we want entrepreneurs to think big because they spearhead the innovation. And um, because post COVID is pre the next crisis, if I may say so, um, innovation should not just emerge um, in a crisis, but thanks to strategic um, leadership and investment, because ultimately it's about people that make it or, or break it. Um, and let us focus on this critical success factor aside from building the um, ecosystem. So the potential is huge, I'd say. Thank you, um, Amir. Amir Hosseini, co-founder of uh, Curry Up Now. Uh, you're um, in, in the States. Uh, you're a co-founder. And Isabel just uh, gave you a, a slight warning about uh, how to behave. Uh, let's hear it from you. You know, I think uh, this COVID experience on an entrepreneurial level has been very interesting. I uh, started uh, Curry Up Now right after the financial crisis in 2008. And that, uh, that organization was born specifically because of that. Um, and, you know, over the last 10 and a half, 11 years, we really grew that business, a national brand. And, you know, you have all these plans as an entrepreneur, you have growth, you have strategy, you have all these things figured out and then something big like COVID hits, right? So as an entrepreneur, uh, you have to fight the fire first, realign, and then figure out your strategy. The first part is survival. Then it's, you know, look for opportunity and then go back out there and, and have that true grit in, in being resilient. Um, I can say that for me, taking a startup beyond post COVID is something that, that hits uh, to home um, because I'm on another company now, which, which I started in COVID and, um, and it's grown significantly um, since, since its inception, which probably wouldn't have happened uh, if, if COVID wasn't in, wasn't kind of in play. Uh, and I say that because, you know, as an entrepreneur, yeah, you, you have to worry about people. You have to worry about team. You have to have kind of passion. You have to have the energy. But on the business side, one thing that's super important, you have to have product market fit. You have to have a product that fits in the market, that that's sellable and scalable and, and allows you to grow. Um, And, and solve an issue, right? So product market fit revolves around solving an issue uh, or solving a problem. And sometimes organizations don't know they have this problem until something something like uh, a COVID occurs or, you know, or just maybe streamlining a process, right? It could be so simple um, with, with the tools that are available uh, in technology today. I think, I think like innovation can happen anywhere now right? People can do meetings anywhere now. You can, you can network anywhere now and you can essentially build a company from anywhere now. 
Uh, but I think just going back for me as an entrepreneur, when you're looking to build something, do you have product market fit? Do you solve a problem? Is it a tangible solution? Um, and I, I think maybe I'll close there and, and we can kind of move forward. And what do you see as um, a change from uh, before and after the pandemic? You know, it's it's hard to say. So my focus is probably s small to medium sized businesses. And I think something some things that that many don't talk about is, well, if everybody worked from home partially or fully, what happens to those businesses in high density environments? Right. Because that's the backbone of most economies. If you're not going out to lunch, if you're not shopping at the local store during the hours of, you know, 10 to 2. Uh, those areas would get depressed. They're relying on that income from from uh, from those of us who go into the office every day, right? So, at some point, government funding or support runs out. How do they stay? How's it, how do they stay sustainable? How do they grow? How do they afford rent? How do they take care of their families? So, I, I think there's a question there um, as to how how things could change, if that makes sense. And and can you um, see a way um, how startups um, can survive without this uh, government support? Or can you give them some advice as to how they go back to the normal balances so, of capital? So, so let me rephrase that. So I think there's two types of startup. There's venture-backed startup, right? And there's your bootstrap mom-and-pop company that's, that's kind of... Um, you know, they have a retail outlet, they have retail, right? So I think VC for the most part has been generally insulated. You see a lot of deals occurring. I'm in Silicon Valley. Uh, there's like a never ending flow of money for a great idea and product market fit. Um, but but I, I think if you if you think startup in a terms of small business, because those are startups as well, um, there's going to be some difficulty uh, you know, in, in the non-venture back space, especially if you're talking about retail and, and a not non-digital marketing platform, if that makes sense. So you have to look at two of them holistically. One seems to be doing really, really well. The other one is there's there's grave concern. Okay, thank you. Um, Olusa, Olusola, you have a very difficult name for me to pronounce. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Sola Adenuga, yeah, I'm trying hard. Yeah, trying. <laughs> <laughs> you're the chief executive officer of uh, Ola Systems, and um, you're from uh, Nigeria. Yes. Um, what do you want to share with us? Um, well, uh, I'll just share a little bit from my own point of view with the issue of startup. Um, uh, some few things that needs to be put into consideration uh, for startups. And um, I think at this time, uh, companies should not, startup companies should not really relax too much. Uh, it's quite important to automate their processes. And um, I guess with what has happened, there's flexible uh, work environment. That is, you can work from home and you can also work on premise. And um, I think also for startup, it's quite important they consider the fact that they can really, you know, go into partnership. Uh, that is, they can collaborate with other um, companies to to focus on what they're doing. Um, giving an example, if your startup is, for example, an e-commerce, you might want to um, collaborate with a logistic company. Um also, at this point, because nobody appreciated all these problems and um, thank God we're getting out of it, uh, I think the issue of having to cut costs uh, is quite important. In this part of the world, uh, what what uh, was quite uh, obvious was the fact that raw materials cannot really come in as uh, it used to. Uh, so raw materials have to be sourced uh, locally. Again, it has its own advantage because uh, it's like looking inwards. And uh, if you look at the issue of advertising, it's um, we have the social media. It became more um, quite prominent uh, at this period. So that wasn't too... It was, but 
really it became more more important. And then uh, the issue of virtual technology, um, of course, you find people using virtual technology. What's happening? Yeah, virtual technology. And I think, uh, I hope you didn't lose me at that point. <laughs> no, no, no. Please keep going. Okay. And I think the issue of uh, adaptability for startup is very important. I think any startup these days should think of the fact that anything could happen. We pray it doesn't. Uh, we look at the issue of um, companies, you know, producing things like um, um, alcohol now going on to produce uh, sanitizer, uh, people in fashion now having to, you know, produce uh, face masks. And I think having to be persistent, uh, you have to persevere in order to continue to be in business is quite important. Uh, so, and uh, for me, that's um, my own uh, part of it, that uh, the God factor also comes in. We yeah. did studiously pray and, uh, uh, you know, and be optimistic all the time. I think having all this for a startup would be, you know, quite good. And uh, Olusola, in, in your experience, um, which change did you make during um, uh, the COVID time with Ola Systems and a change which you say, I definitely want to take that to the post-pandemic uh, uh, era? Well, the most important one I would tell you is the issue of having to be able to work online. Um, we it was hard at the beginning and um being an IT company we had to also see how we could uh, also solve problems online as opposed to going on premise because most of our customers we couldn't really you know get into their premise in fact they're not there so we had to be able to do quite a number of things online i think the issue of having to walk now we have a hybrid we walk online we walk offline so I think it's something that um, I never thought was possible, but um, it's something that we, I think moving forward, we will probably have to get used to that. Uh, again, it will help us uh, in terms of making sure that in case there's any issue later on, for whatsoever reason, we could still continue as a business. So I think that's the most, you know, that I, I think we were able to get out of this. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um... Uh, let me welcome uh, Pep, Pep Gomez. We will uh, turn to you uh, later, but first we go to uh, Anil. Anil Adva Advani, your founder and managing uh, partner of Inventors Law um, in the States. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, great hearing from everyone else. And I'm going to share my thoughts and also address some of the comments I, I, I heard from my co-panelists, uh, because it's a great sort of collaboration learning process and opportunity. Uh, I just want to start by saying um, this time last year, I was doing a lot of panels and the theme of those panels was how do we survive? You know, we were all shit was literally hitting the fan. And the assumption was that most businesses that that I represented or that I was working with would actually fall away. I was Frankly, uh, this is probably the first time I've been admitting, admitting publicly. I was thinking about how my business would survive, who I would have to lay off, how I would have to cut costs. Uh, Twelve months later, you know, we have um, obviously survived. We are thriving. Um, and I don't want to undervalue what's happening in the rest of the world. As Amir said, there's two parallel worlds, right? One is the, the world that we're living in, Silicon Valley, and the technology investment world, which is doing really well. And the other part of the world. So I don't want to take anything away from the troubles and that continue to you know, uh, uh, affect a large majority of people uh, outside of the technology world. But within the technology world, being fortunate enough to be on the right side of this, this divide as such, our business has grown 3x, almost 3x. You know, we've, uh, we've started and we are a small firm. We are 25 lawyers, so it's not a global firm. Uh, but we have started uh, around 140 new companies in the last 12 months. Uh, They've raised, you know, over a billion dollars, 30 adventure financings and 12 M&A deals. So, so just to give you a sort of a facts on what's happening with us. And then if you amplify that with the larger firms and the larger economy, obviously, as you all know, numbers are staggering. So I think what's emerged is very clearly uh, a, a clear reliance worldwide and across industries on technology, right? 
And to give you that, right, I mean, the, the more recent panels I've been on, the CEOs have been talking about how uh, the adoption and the acceleration of digitization has gone 10, 10 years ahead, right? What they were planning 10 years ahead, they've been forced to, and the opportunity and the market exists and the funding exists to accelerate that by 10 years, right? So that's what's happened in, in the technology world. What does that mean? It means opportunities have also grown, right? And, and we can go into details about the opportunities, but in the healthcare space, obviously, but also in any other, you know, any other business that, that can be digitized or be contactless. Food delivery is an example. Right? I may talked about how retailers and restaurants are suffering, but, you know, there is food delivery that's coming to the rescue and it's growing. So I think there's also, as an entrepreneur, you have to look at opportunities and figure out how to work with what you have and where the economy and sort of predict also the future of where the, where the world is heading to, right? So, so class talked about TWAC. I think we are in the TWAC world, right? I mean, if, if ever we go on to the real world, I don't know in Silicon Valley whether we actually will or not, but it's not going to be more than the Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays that class referred to. I just came up with my own term off. I think it will only be only Fridays. You know? So we'll probably just go in only Fridays and that will affect commercial real estate, right? So if you're in the commercial real estate, you need to understand how to cut your losses, how to use your office more efficiently, maybe get equity, bring startups in, whatever it is that you need to do. And I can be very creative, but I'll hold myself back. But there are opportunities, right? So within the tech world, there are lots of opportunities we go into. If you are in retail or restaurants and other industries that have got affected, you have to understand, even if people are only having Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever that is, they still need to eat the rest of the days, right? You have to find a way to deliver food. And the key part, I think, and the, the way the startups have worked, successful ones have worked, and I think we can adopt to other non-tech uh, businesses, is build partnerships, right? So if you're a restaurant, just to give you a simple example, build a partnership with the, with the businesses so that their employees need to eat on the one day that they're working from home, on Fridays, whatever they're working from home. Find a way to use technology to deliver more efficiently. You have all the data. You have those people in front of you. Find a way to continue to build your business around that instead of worrying about, you know, the fact that no one's coming into your business. Mm -hmm. If you're a retail business, I, I'm very disappointed. I'll, I'll just make last one, one last comment. But if you're a retail business, I'm disappointed. No one's come up with a work, work from home line, you know, clothing line, you know. That's in front of you. If you are a fashion designer or clothing business, just create a work from home and you can, I would buy clothes that are more, you know, reasonable that I can, I'm wearing shorts right now, <laughs> but I would <laughs> buy pants that are, you know, comfortable, but I can walk around in a business meeting, right? I mean, there are opportunities. You just have to push yourself to build and look at where the opportunities are and adapt very fast. I mean, it is a pressure now, you know, everything that you were planning to do, as I said, in 10 years, you have to now do in the next few years because, you know, the opportunities are shrinking, the funding, the challenges financially, cash flow, all of that is shrinking. But it's there. You know, if you if you really believe in the business, there are ways to build, build, build partnership. Though. You know, I've, I've done that myself. Clients that I was squeezing for every dollar, now I'm investing in them, you know, looking for the longer term, seeing sort of how we can build the partnership. If, if, if my business suffers in the next six months, we have to somewhat assume some of the business in my business, any business will suffer. Who are the right partners that will get you over the hump, right? Invest in those in some form or the other. And then sort of they'll take you over the ride. I think we have to just be creative and very sort of focus on what we need to do. Now, I'm, I'm glad we um, uh, depart on, a, on an upbeat note because you started with uh, survival. And then I thought, oh, uh, you started 114 new companies. So that's already good. But uh, we ended in opportunity. So that um, that is very hopeful. Uh, Pep, uh, Pep Gomez, you're the last uh, speaker. You're the co-founder and chairman of Raby uh, in the UK. Um, just let us know what Raby is and um, share with us um, your lessons. Yeah, first, thank you very much, Annette. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, so I'm, 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 I'm the founder of Raby. What we do is we are a climate change prevention company based in Southern Europe. So essentially, our priority is working with regulators to make sure that they have an answer to all of those kind of infrastructure industries that are being accelerated thanks to technology. Um, in concrete, one thing we do or one thing we focus on is on the transportation sector, making solutions that are similar to what people call in the venture capital industry micro-mobility, uh, so the limes, the birds of the world. Um, but we make that to be, you know, profitable, compatible with civility, um, um, nice with the city, um, and, um, you know, 
I, I, I wanted to address three points because I really enjoyed uh, listening to class, to Anil and to Isabel. And there was something they said that, you know, I fully agree with. Um, and, and let me let me make it very sure. But I, I think uh, illustrating this with examples would be very, very interesting. So, um, you know, one thing that surprised me a lot that uh, well, surprised me, I agree a lot with Isabel, is that, the, you know, all the companies fail because of one reason. And I think this reason is the team. I agree with her that, you know, it's very easy to, you know, blame on uh, COVID and blame on change of a strategy and failure. We, we're mistaken with the strategy, whatever. At the end of the game, you know, a common factor that I've seen in all the companies that started is any company makes it or fails it because of the team, right? Um, and regarding with the team, I see three things that personally happened to us in our company that made us be much stronger. First thing is, uh, what they call the market liquidity, right? So thanks to COVID, what we perceived is that the market is much more liquid, much more liquid in the sense that, you know, if you are an entrepreneur is, you know, ma you take decisions of hiring somebody or firing somebody much faster than before. Before, potentially, you were like, you know, inviting people to your offices, you make all these kind of superficial aspects of the startup world, like nice offices, nice line, let's meet, let's do this, let's do that. Now people are much more practical and the market is much more liquid because, you know, you really uh, can quickly identify who's really passionate about your company who's really not passionate about your company. And I'm talking about an entrepreneur perspective, right? Um, the second thing is, you know, this kind of looking for opportunities that Anil was mentioning, this kind of shaking yourself a little bit. Um, I remember this story when we started, you know, we, we, we were doing this kind of transportation thing that I was talking to you about. And as you can imagine, our business went, you know, shut down from, you know, one day to the other. And we, we all had to make drastic changes to our business, right? Sometimes as entrepreneurs, you know, we are conscious that we have to make some changes in our organization, but sometimes we don't do those changes because we just feel, you know, oh, this is working, you know, I don't want to change it or like, you know, you, you really don't want, many of our, you know, it, it depends on the perspective of entrepreneurs, but many of these entrepreneurs, they say, you know, I, I, I just don't take that decision. I just you don't, don't do that because I'm focused on other things. I think this kind of shake forces all of us to take decisions that otherwise we needed to make anyways in our business, but we had to do it because otherwise we would shut down, right? And then last thing I would say is this kind of step back in order to speed up, which I really like, which is, uh, you know, this idea that, you know, I had, and I think it's, it's, it's you know, very important, which is, I think there were many, you know, sectors uh, floated with venture capital money. There were many companies that were just raising money like crazy and burning money like crazy, uh, but without a sustainability aspect behind of it. Because we are a sustainable company, we always prioritize sustainability um, in all ways. And this is not only like, you know, you know, climate change, but also like in the way you raise capital and the way you burn that capital and the way you build companies. I think the companies, the way they were growing prior to COVID were not sustainable. And I think COVID has given some sustainability <laughs> as an important requirement for the companies to really succeed. So I think, you know, if there's one thing, a few good things that the pandemic had, which were very few things, one thing would be to bring back this kind of sustainability aspect uh, when building a company. Um, and that would be all from, from us. Thank you, uh, uh, Pat. You said, uh, I make it short, but uh, in the end, you took um, uh, the sorry, same Sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem, no problem. <laughs> um, we have a lot of um, um, panelists uh, today, uh, so I don't want to waste uh, more time by speaking myself. Uh, I think we have time for all of you to um, make some remarks about what you heard from the other panelists. Um, but then we need to uh, really stick to one minute each. Is that okay? Who wants to go first? I, I can go first. I, I just want to echo what Pep said. And, and I um, keep a timer. Okay. So if All I right. raise my hand, it's over. Okay. Go ahead. So I just want to, yeah, I'll keep it short. I, I want to echo what Pep said. I, I think 100%, I mean, and that's been my advice, and I've seen really boys becoming men in this 12 months. The change starts with, I don't know, sound cliche, but the change starts with you, right? I mean, you have to, instead of trying to solve everyone else's problems, you have to figure out what your problems are, focus on solving that. That's part of your leadership. If you're a founder, CEO of a startup, you have to figure out what you're doing wrong, who are the people that are doing it wrong or right, make quick decisions. You have to make those decisions, right? Fair business, my survival. Just focus on yourself, internal teams, everything else sort of will play itself out. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Anil. Who's next? Well, just to add to that, I think um, also the most important is uh, being persistent and uh, uh, to persevere. Uh, I think that as the leader, as a leader, really, really, you need to be able to be persistent and uh, persevere. Uh, I'll make it as, I mean, th that's the summary, really. Very good. Mm -hmm. Happy to go next. I Class. Not, not so much a reflection on, on, on what others have said, maybe, but the, the, the stepping back and uh, the, the, the taking stock and then figuring out how to accelerate. I, I think once we are pro uh, re properly through the pandemic, to step back and say what actually worked better during the pandemic and, and which of those elements should we keep going forward. And one example, uh, sort of a big picture example, is the fact that we faced um, a pandemic and that we as a world managed to develop and produce a vaccine at scale uh, that was unprecedented. We have other big, big challenges as society. And I, I, how can we use the, the entrepreneurial community and, and sort of accelerate some of the innovations that are necessary, learning from what we did during the pandemic? Thanks. So yes, agree. So it's, it's about the art of balancing action and reflection. And I would like to make a, a quick comment on Amir's uh, product market fit. So I fully agree. Um, it's just go look for these big problems worth solving and don't start with a solution and, and look for a problem uh, because that's quite a challenging path. And spend 95% on the problems and try to understand it in depth and then 5% on the solution. Of course, I'm always stating, but just to make the point. So. Thank you for this great discussion. If, if I could just come back to what Klaas has said earlier, I think it's a very important point that got sort of hidden in, in the conversation, but he, he talked about how businesses have to rely on themselves and, and get ahead of the, what the government is doing. I think obviously, you know, take as much free money as you can get as the government is giving, you know, take it if you can and obviously look through, but, but I'm, don't lie, don't do anything wrong and legal, unethical, but take it, you know, as much as you can. There's no doubt you, it, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to your shareholders, you owe it to your employees, you owe it to your, your family, you owe it to your lawyers to pay their fees, you know, take that money. But don't, don't the depend the on the lawyers. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll send you my email. <laughs> uh, don't depend on governments because, as we've seen, one of the, well, despite you know, the class, that was a huge achievement coming out of the vaccine and it is you know, very commendable, but that's against scientists with a lot of good government support pressure, unprecedented. But don't expect the governments to hand you out or take you out from these crises. You're on your own at the, at the end of the day. You know? So it's sort of aligned with what Pep said earlier about it's, it's all about you. you as a leader, as a team. You have to keep focusing on that. Uh, as, take whatever you can, use all the resources, but don't wait for anyone else to come and bail you out necessarily. And, and despite that, Pep had a big and bigger smile on his face uh, when you started. Pep, um, your uh, one minute. No, I loved this free, free money thing. I loved it because I think totally agree with Anil. I think you have to be persistent. I think that uh, Olusola said that. I think this is very important. I think as an entrepreneur, you have to speed up. You know, if the government, if Europe is creating free money, printing free money, just take it because somebody else will take it. Your competitor will take it. So if you don't do it, you're stupid. You're in less less ability to compete with the other with the other companies. So um, I agree totally, Neil. Um, when I started, and basically ten seconds. Yeah? When I started, uh, when this happened, all of this happened with the pandemic. I put three people of my team full time, just dedicating to what the government was doing to pay, give subsidies, all of these things, excuses for not performance or for not performing in a good company, right? I would have been much more aggressive, but all I'm saying is like, you know, we, we, we were very fortunate to do that. And I think that helped us a lot as well. Thanks. And Amir? Yeah, I, I think uh, as founders, you have to realize that you you have a brand or you have a company that has started because you have a vision, right? And it's really important to stay the course on whatever that vision is. And you have to do whatever it takes to, to make it succeed. You have to be hungry, right? You, you, you have to want it more than anything else. And you have to envision that every day. Uh, I, think, I think, you know, being able to, to stop yourself from complacency is huge and driving that within your team 
to always do more, to get more. You know, your job as a leader is to get the best out of every single person that's on your team. And uh, and you have to identify that. And when you identify those those roles and, and you're able to get that out of those players, then then you will see your, your brand succeed even more than what you ever thought. And um, I think key takeaway is you have to be hungry. You have to you have to identify those traits and take advantage of whatever is your way. And don't always look at, you know, at everything in a negative fashion. You can you can find you can find a lot of opportunity in in situations like a pandemic for sure. So thanks a lot. Um, and in the interest of time, because we need to move on, I just want to thank you for giving us your thoughts your and your insights and also your precious time and enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.